This lesson applies the tactical games approach to teaching an advanced lesson of volleyball. In this context, the students were given the tactical problem of winning the point. Students were required to develop their knowledge of where to place the ball when spiking. Not only does the tactical teaching approach promote interest in games, it places the emphasis on the what to do in game situations. It's noted in Mitchell, Griffin and Oslin that mistakes commonly observed in young children in various sports may stem from a lack of knowledge about what to do in the context of a given sports situation. What is important to understand is that the decision making process precedes the skill execution. What is the point of having a skill and not knowing when or in what context to use it? Hopper and Kruselbrink suggest that tactical awareness leads to effective skill selection and skill execution. This doesn't mean to say that we ignore the skill development, rather we should combine the teaching of tactical understanding with skill development, rather than focusing on one or the other. In regards to motor skills, one of the challenging aspects of teaching them is providing demonstrations which best guide students to optimal technique and performance. Darden emphasises that demonstrations are the fundamental tools in teaching motor skills. One of the most accepted notions may be that effective demonstrations must involve highly skilled performers showing the ideal technique and outcome. Recent evidence suggests that demonstrations by experts may not provide the best learning conditions for students. Strategies for using less skilled performers for motor skill demonstrations may also be effective. A common notion of an effective demonstration is that it builds a perceptual blueprint which in turn serves as a representation of the what to do as well as a comparator for detecting errors and making corrections. Certainly in the early stages of learning only an expert model would be shown as the students would not yet be experienced enough to critique the skill. Bailey has suggested that demonstrations are useful when a teacher needs to highlight a specific technical point. It's essential that all pupils can see since they're relying on the visual information. They can be worthwhile presenting from more than one angle. They could be presented in multimodal formats like a YouTube or a wiki. They're appropriate to the learner's stage of learning and they should reflect the context in which the students will be performing the skill. It's unwise to demonstrate only part of the skill or perform the skill with a different rhythm from the one it should have. They also recommend that teachers perform the skill, then break up the skill, then perform the skill again. Whitting's information processing model can be applied to skilled demonstrations and skill learning. The students observe the demonstration which acts as the display. The sensory organs, which in this case are the eyes, pass the information to the brain. The perceptual mechanism interprets the demonstration and then the translatory mechanism deals with receiving the input information and uses the memory of previous stimuli to decide upon a response. After the students are shown a skilled demonstration like this one, the effector mechanism constructs a motor plan which in turn informs the muscles of the movement requirements. The muscular system responds to the information and produces a response based on the information provided by the perceptual mechanisms. This type of behaviour is a process where an observer or student attempts to replicate a behaviour that's been demonstrated by another individual. In regards to the demonstration needing to replicate the appropriate rhythm of the skill, Breslin and his colleagues have found that the human brain prioritises the extraction of relative motion information in skilled demonstrations. Relative motion is all of the components relative to each other. In a skilled volleyball demonstration like the one shown, Students would be prioritising such information as the speed at which the performer is travelling in relation to when she raises her hand to strike the ball. This is specifically why a ball should not always be used in skilled demonstrations. If students are prioritising relative motion information, then the introduction of the ball would shift the focus of the demonstration and make it more complex for the students to process. In an advanced class, students may benefit more from skilled demonstrations that include the use of apparatus. They would then prioritise such information as the speed and flight of the ball in relation to the sequence and rhythm of the skill being performed. This approach to skill demonstrations has led researchers to suggest that the development of motor skills is guided by the search for coordination patterns in dynamic displays both in and out of action. Alaboud and McClester and their colleagues support these findings and suggest that relative motion demonstrations may well be more of an effective teaching tool since slow motion demonstrations interfere with the pickup of relative motion information. 
This doesn't necessarily mean that we should favour real-time demonstrations over video demonstrations, more that we need to be aware that learners need to view demonstrations that highlight relative motion information. Practice and skilled demonstrations are only one component of skill learning. Teachers who have a good understanding of biomechanical principles can employ a variety of strategies to assist students with skill learning. For example, skilled diagrams can assist in demonstrating relative motion of a particular skilled movement sequence and its subsequent analysis. Arrows showing the directions of forces are commonly used in free body diagrams. These can help to visualise the many complex factors of a movement situation in a simplistic form for analysis. In regards to a Year 12 Physical Education program, free body diagrams can be used to analyse skill movement as well as to visualise more complex biomechanical concepts such as flexion, force and resistance. This lesson looks beyond skill acquisition and also focuses on the interpersonal and cognitive domains associated with physical education. Sidentop has suggested that record keeping provides helpful feedback for players and teams. Players can see where they've improved or where improvement may be needed. These also help players and teams to develop new goals to achieve. These record keeping skills can be transferred into a sport education setting where team members are required to keep scores and act as statisticians for contests during seasons. Cones can be an excellent tool for showing students where they need to be during deliberate practice drills but they do not reflect an actual game scenario. Barry and his colleagues have found that both deliberate play and deliberate practice contribute significantly to the development of sport exercise, especially in relation to the skills of perception and decision making. There is evidence that indicates the time spent in competitions is a pivotal factor in the development of expertise. This is why it's so important to make drills as much like the game as possible. Some expert team sport athletes have reported that they regard competition as the most helpful activity for developing their game-based perceptual and decision-making skills. In this type of game setting, students can improve their tactical performance through convergent thinking strategies and an increased game appreciation. What physical educators must understand is that an attainment of expertise is not possible in one unit. Lee and Wishart have concluded that expertise is only achieved by the most skilled and cannot be acquired without some 10,000 hours of practice. This means we can't possibly expect students to become experts, rather we can aim to improve their strategic awareness and game appreciation. Bunker and Thorpe have said that while absolute levels of performance will vary, each and every child is able to participate in decision making based upon tactical awareness, thereby retaining an interest and involvement in the game. Grouping students may be one of the most important factors teachers have to consider when setting up a game like scenario or activity. Team captains are an ineffective way of choosing teams or groups and can further highlight inequalities between groups and students. Shim suggests that ultimately grouping needs to be quick and effective and meet the objectives of the lesson. She also suggests that grouping strategies need to change to ensure that the process does not become monotonous and boring for students. A few strategies to consider could be pre-assigned groups, student choice groups, object groups and by random characteristics. Groups can also be selected by differentiating according to readiness in regards to a particular skill or movement sequence. Groups were chosen in this lesson at random by the teacher. Most of you really setting up the spike and going down the line of the school. What This highlights a quick and effective way to group that minimises time wasting and gets the students straight into the game. A peer officiator was used for this game scenario. Sidentop emphasises that students need to experience diverse roles when it comes to sport. This helps them to better understand all the elements contributing to a successful sport experience. By undertaking different roles, students have the chance to see the sport from a much broader perspective, exposing them to and possibly preparing them for sport-related professions. This lesson demonstrates how a strategic problem is implemented into a modified game environment, which ultimately draws on students' ability to make decisions. In this game, the students were asked to rainbow serve and they were asked to catch the ball when it was returned over the net.
By focusing on the game in this context, students are encouraged to develop a greater understanding for the game. Bunker and Thorpe suggest that while the full adult version of the game presents a long-term goal at which to aim for, it is necessary in the early years of secondary schooling to introduce the children to a variety of game forms in accordance with their age and experience. If I had let the game continue without modification, the emphasis of the lesson would have been setting up the attack rather than winning the point, since the students were not yet proficient enough to successfully dig the ball into the setup for the successful skill execution. This approach allowed students to get into position more effectively and focus on the tactical problem of winning the point. These off-the-ball skills are almost certainly only developed in an environment where the students and teacher can question and guide positioning and performance. Hung has demonstrated how cooperative learning groups achieve better results than those who study alone. Cooperative learning facilitates higher level cognitive reasoning, increased achievement and retention, and higher level conceptual understanding. It is also evident that students who discuss lesson material while working with a partner generate more elaborative connections between new and existing information, resulting in a deeper understanding of lesson content. This is strongly linked with the theory of cognitive effects on social interaction, where knowledge is socially constructed and that social interactions, interactions are necessary for children. Learning takes place when old knowledge structures are reconstructed into new knowledge through the reconciliation of conflicting perspectives. Cooperative learning represents a fertile environment for inducing cognitive conflict. In groups, students may experiment with opinions and ideas or observe the behaviour and skill movements of more competent group members. Cooperative learning involves working together to accomplish shared goals, using skills that benefit each group member. Certainly, this is supporting the need for students to self-evaluate, give peer feedback and answer guided questions. Although this may reduce the need for a command style of teaching, it would give the students the opportunity to experience convergent discovery where they can work together to discover solutions to a given tactical problem. The final part of this lesson integrates the guided discovery approach. Moston and Ashworth have suggested that the teacher asks a series of questions which stimulates a student's set of corresponding responses. Each question or problem posed by the teacher elicits a single, correct movement response or answer that is discovered by the student. In this case, the students were required to identify the correct on-the-ball and off-the-ball skills that were discovered during the lesson. They were also required to identify where to try to aim when spiking. Enough time was provided for students to respond to the guided questions and the teacher clarified some ideas for the students. So how did you guys find that activity when we when I stopped it and got you to catch catch the serve? Was that easier or? Yeah. Yeah. And did you find that you were getting better at striking or any general comments? Getting better at judging where the sets go. Yep. Yep. Good. So where are we trying to place this bike? Far to the back. Sorry. Far to the back. Yep. So deep. Stuff have a point. It's it's good to go down as well. So, so uh, just going back to a couple of weeks ago. So, what are some uh, off the ball skills when we're setting up for the point and spiking? Point. So communication with the team. Moving. Yes. Yeah, so getting into position for the spike. We're getting into position for the set. Being able to read the ball. And what are some on the ball? On the ball. Yes. Sorry. On the ball. Spike itself. Yeah, the spike itself. Yeah, if you get a bad set, you're not going to be able to spike it. Down court, cross court, down the ball. Basically. 